You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another session of PAS 892, Exemplary Practices in Catholic Teaching and Learning. I'm Dr. Sebastian Mafud, Professor of Interdisciplinary Studies at Holy Apostles College and Seminary. And we have an excellent guest with us today, uh, Dr. Peter Redpath. And I'll introduce him in just a moment. But first, uh, Cynthia, uh, Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson will lead us in prayer. Uh, Cynthia? Hey, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, So to introduce uh, Dr. Redpath is an awesome task. Um, But I'm going to uh, give it a shot. So uh, Dr. Peter A. Redpath is CEO of the Aquinas School of Leadership and a contributing scholar in the Thomistic Studies program at the University of Abat Oliva, Barcelona, Spain. He was, until just recently, the chair of the Christian Wisdom Concentration in the Master of Arts in Philosophy program at Holy Apostles College and Seminary, a position that's now held by uh, one of the attendees here at today's conference, uh, uh, Eduardo Bernot, uh, with whom uh, we'll be talking a little bit later. Uh, Dr. Redpath is the author, editor of 12 philosophical books in dozens of articles and book reviews. One of his philosophical books is here in my possession, published by Enroute Books and Media uh, several years ago. It's called A Not-So-Elementary Christian Metaphysics. Let me hold it up to the camera a bit. And um, a uh, wonderful quote by, um, uh, by Father James Shaw, wonderful testimonial. Uh, uh, James said, this is a book I wish I had had in my earlier years of study. In reading it, I found that many notions and points I had often wondered about, or about which I needed more explanation, were much clearer after Redpath dealt with them. So if you don't have a copy of this book, you can get yours today at enroutebooksandmedia.com or wherever great books are sold. Uh, To continue, uh, and I will have to be brief because uh, if I were to say all of the things that Dr. Redpath has done, uh, there would not be enough books in the whole world to contain them all. So I will simply add that he has given over 200 invited guest lectures nationally and internationally, is president and co-founder of the International Etienne Gilson Society, co-founder and vice president of the Gilson Society, former vice president of the American Maritime Association, chairman of the board of the Universities of Western Civilization and the Angelicum Academy Homeschool Program, a member of the board of directors of the Great Books Academy Homeschool Program, a member of the board of trustees of the Institute for Advanced Philosophic Research, a member of the board of directors and executive committee of the Catholic Foundation. That gives you an idea of the caliber of man uh, that we have with us today, a caliber of scholar, Thomistic scholar, uh, Dr. Peter Redpath. Uh, Dr. Peter, uh, uh, take it away. It's all yours. Well, thank you, uh, Sebastian. Am I coming through loud and clear, I hope? Loud and clear. Good. Um, that uh, number of publications is now uh, up to 17 uh, books uh, with uh, the uh, uh, upcoming publication of um, uh, one with en route uh, books and media on uh, how to... Uh, uh, listen and how to speak, uh, a um, uh, which is uh, a work that's subtitled that's "Standing on the Shoulders of Giants" uh, to uh, renew uh, uncommon and common sense uh, wisdom in the contemporary world. Um, so it's actually a book dealing with the nature of common sense and how to renew it. Um, I'll have other- to all of your bios. Yeah. And it's um, uh, there's another book coming out too, where I, which I co-author uh, with a couple of scholars uh, from uh, the Catholic University of Lublin, uh, uh, Imelda uh, Klodna, 
and uh, and um, Arthur uh, Marmor Plisecki, uh, somewhat difficult for me to pronounce, and that's uh, on uh, the great ideas of uh, religion and freedom, uh, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, subtitled. Uh, uh, reinterpreting uh, the great ideas, uh, semiotically reinterpreting the great ideas movement for the 21st century. Uh, and then a republication of a book I had written several years ago called How to Read a Difficult Book, A Beginner's Guide to the Lost Art of Philosophical Reading. That, uh, that's going to be published uh, by uh, Public Philosophy Press. Uh, it had to be Reinput actually because the original file was lost on it, and so I thank them for doing that. Um, and what I'd like to start with here is the uh, since um, uh, on route uh, books and media is going to be coming out, I think uh, within a few weeks uh, of this uh, this work on uh, how to um, listen and how to speak. Um, part of the concluding chapter of that, which would give it, give the people, uh, the readers a gist for why I think it is uh, crucially important uh, for uh, Western civilization. I, in fact, I think it's the most important work that I've written to date. Um, and um, from chapter 15, which I, I, I entitled Lesson 15, I did these in lessons. Uh, common sense, the personal meeting point in and through which providence first touches and Oh, uh, Peter, I'm sorry, uh, you're muted. Okay. Sorry, okay. That, that, that was my fault. Uh, go ahead, you were saying... Um, yeah, okay, so... Um, that the, the, the title of the chapter is Common Sense, the personal meeting point in and through which providence first touches an animal soul as that of a human person. And I want to read the first two sections on that um, because it'll give people a, a gist of uh, a very quick synopsis of the import of the work in relationship to the teaching of St. Thomas and to higher education and to contemporary civilization and its preservation. Uh, the first section is uniquely human common sense as a participation in divine wisdom that specifies an animal soul as essentially rational. The analogy of unity between God and human beings in right reason, providence, wisdom, prudence, common sense, all species of law and virtue and conscience. The chief aim of this concluding chapter is to defend and consider some implications for the contemporary world of the following thesis. According to St. Thomas Aquinas, and in truth, human common sense as distinct from brute animal common sense or animal instinct is the uniquely personal in the sense of metaphysical and moral way in which human persons enter into a meeting of understandings intellectual communion and communication with a qualitat qualitatively higher than human wisdom, which I call God. Thomas understood the latter to be divine wisdom. Implicit within this thesis is the claim that this unique manner of participating in this communion of wisdom is partially the product of the qualitatively unique human faculty that Aquinas calls cogitative or particular reason in which natural law appears chiefly to exist as a concrete commanding principle, and out of which to some extent grow to maturity all human, comma, natural and acquired habits, habitus, virtues, virtus. While the claims I make above might strike some readers as being exaggerated or in one way or another false, I stand by them. In fact, they necessarily flow out of what I have already reported about St. Thomas's claim that human rationality locates our specific difference in an otherness within the sensitive or animal part of the intellectual soul. By generating the faculty of sensory reasoning, sentient command and control, particular or cogitative reason, which St. Thomas claims corresponds to instinct 
and brute animals, St. Thomas Aquinas maintains God creates in an animal soul a personally human and immortal single rational principle able to function abstractly in a non-sensory way and concretely in a sensory fashion. When not focusing attention on a concrete individual animal activity, acting under direction from a human being, the intellectual soul causes its single faculty of reason or understanding intellectually to operate in an, in, in an abstract and syllogistic way. When choosing to reason concretely to move animal faculties under direction of this same human being, the intellectual soul causes its intellectual and reasoning power to flow into and become activated within the sensory faculties that exist within the sensible part of the single human soul. Now, this is crucial to understand in St. Thomas because it's through this faculty of particular or cogitative reason uh, that uh, a, a human being operates a, as a rational command and control principle, uh, uh, in, including acting with free choice uh, wisely and prudently, prudently uh, foolishly or imprudently, commonsensically or non-commonsensically, uh, to flow into the faculties, appetites, passions, and all their activities. Huh? And it's through these activities that move the human body that the human person moves human reason as a directing principle into the whole of material creation and causes it to become more or less humanly rational. Prudent or imprudent, commonsensical or non-commonsensical, wise or foolish. In doing this, in a sense, through what Adler calls, Morton Rattler calls a meeting of minds, but is better called a meeting of understandings between divine wisdom and animal human nature, the rational part of the soul enables the sensitive part to achieve its animal perfection as an acting sensitive soul, an acting person something that no animal soul can achieve, being a deliberative, metaphysical, and moral free animal. In addition, through the sensory part of the soul, the rational part inclines the whole of the created material order naturally to gravitate toward, become docile toward, not resist being ruled by metaphysically and morally virtuous or vicious human directive. Simultaneously, it causes the morally and metaphysically virtuous or vicious person the person with or without common sense to be a first principle cause and measure of healthy, wisely and prudentially guided social life and personal rule within and throughout the material universe. Right? In maintaining these teachings, Aquinas is doing nothing more than applying to the relationship between God and human beings, what Adler repeatedly refers to as a meeting of minds or an agreement of understanding. Uh, and this is in St. Thomas, these are simply analogous transpositions into his teachings of the teachings of Plato, of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and Plotinus regarding the physical universe being rationally ordered by a divine wisdom or the good in the sense of being an absolute, absolutely perfect in all respects. Okay. Uh, I know that was lengthy, uh, but and to, to put it, to put it briefly, um, Basically, what I'm saying is that according to Saint, according to Saint Thomas, um, uh, the um, the whole of philosophy, the, which is identical with science, is really a reflection on common sense. Uh, what uh, uh, Adler calls uncommon common sense, uh, and uh, uh, Saint Thomas understands this to mean uh, that uh, we are participating in divine wisdom. In divine right reason, uh, divine providence, uh, from which we uh, providencia, from which we derive the term uh, prudence. Huh? This is one of the reasons why people very often um, uh, identify people with common sense as as being prudent. And uh, when you when you consider the way. Uh, Thomas focuses attention on this faculty of particular or cogitative, cogitative reason, uh, something crucial arises in the, the way his teachings have to be understood. St. Thomas does not think that we're the dumbest of angels. Uh, he thinks that they're, we're the smartest of animals. Uh, uh, we are essentially animals, and our specific difference exists in the animal part of the soul. Right? 
if, if, if um, people who read St. Thomas Aquinas don't understand his teaching about cogitative reason, uh, particular reason, they do not understand the teaching of St. Thomas. And that's the case with what I would say about 99% of those people who have reflected on the teaching of St. Thomas since his death uh, and continue to teach. Uh, uh, and it's a, a, a result, as a result of their misunderstanding of the teachings of St. Thomas, the way they've tended in the 20th century, even great thinkers like Maritain and Gilson, not to focus attention on this principle. Uh, I think each of them to some extent understood it. Huh? Uh, but in, in recovering a te the, the, the teachings of St. Thomas after uh, Leo XIII uh, came out uh, in the 19th century and, uh, with, the, uh, with his, uh, his, his great encyclical, encyclical Eterni Patris, um, and Thomism has gone through several, several different waves. Huh? Uh, and uh, it's, it's been very difficult to figure out precisely uh, its nature, both as a, a historical enterprise, on the one hand, scholastic, huh? uh, first being identified with a scholastic philosophy, uh, which was uh, not well understood. And it is, in a sense, a scholastic philosophy in the sense that it is a historical cultural enterprise. Uh, uh, one that involves a team effort across the centuries, uh, uh, which is the way Socrates looked at philosophy. Uh, uh, the ancient Greeks, uh, 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 Plato as well as Aristotle, uh, uh, looked at philosophy uh, as uh, uh, being a cultural habit, right? And being born of religion, uh, actually. Uh, this is one of the significant points about this, this uh, work, the collective volume I've just worked on, about uh, the, um, the notion that it's, uh, religion is the basis of culture. Uh, you, I'm sure, are all familiar with that great work, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, let's see, um, uh, Leisure, the Basis of Culture. Huh? Uh, uh, but uh, which is uh, uh, misnamed huh? uh, from the German uh, uh, because it's uh, uh, it's 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 uh, it's actually cult. Musa um, and um, cult is the title of uh, of uh, the uh, uh, the work in German, uh, and uh, which claims that religion is actually the basis of culture. So that, that this. This getting back to St. Thomas's teaching about, about common sense is really getting back to the whole notion that common sense is in some way related to recognizing the existence of providence. Huh? Uh, and that a person with common sense recognizes to some extent being uh, participating in, in divine wisdom. And uh, uh, that, uh, that participation in divine wisdom uh, is um, uh, not something you can comprehend the implications of uh, if you tend to think of philosophy in terms of a systematic logic, right, which uh, Thomas uh, uh, so often tend to do, uh, or by simply memorizing uh, the, uh, the teachings of St. Thomas Aquinas uh, and uh, reporting them from one uh, generation to another. Huh? If we lose our understanding that philosophy is a habit of the soul, that is chiefly a psychological habit, right? uh, we misunderstand the nature of philosophy. Both philosophy, philosophy and science are identical. I am absolutely convinced of that. Right? This notion that philosophy, some, that science was somehow discovered in the 17th century is a fraud, one of the major frauds of the Enlightenment. Huh? Uh, and it's a, one of the main causes of the contemporary uh, loss of, con of common sense uh, in, the, uh, uh, in Western culture uh, because of the attempt to reduce uh, the whole of understanding uh, uh, and, uh, that is in touch with reality uh, to, uh, to the method of uh, uh, mathematical physics. Uh, and so anything outside of that uh, then tends to 
uh, and not be in touch with reality. Uh, that just becomes um, a personal feelings of subjective, uh, uh, subjective realities like this. Uh, uh, the, um, so let me just start with that and you know, get uh, any feedback that people want to give me related to that. If there's any feedback to come. <laughs> Anyone? This is a room for any, any, any feedback to come. Yeah, If I may, that's something that uh, you just brought to mind. I mean, I agree 100% with everything you, you're saying, Dr. Redpath. Um, but just recently, I was listening to, um, to a Spanish philosopher who died a few years back, uh, talking about uh, the relationship between religion and, and culture. And uh, what you just said reminded me of that conference. And I, it's not like I'm uh, promoting this uh, uh, philosopher, Gustavo Bueno. He's in fact, or he was in fact an atheist and a materialist. He, he even declared himself to be a Marxist. Uh, but he did say that our current understanding of, uh, of culture comes from, um, from the, um, uh, from the, uh, um, idealism of uh, of the germans and the pre romantic view of the, of the germans um the the conception of the volksgeist of uh, herder and uh, and of um uh, and uh, and of fichte who claimed that uh, culture is sort of a product of the uh, of the of the spirit of the people and um and that uh, this uh, myth um came about be precisely because the, um, uh, of the loss of faith and that uh, this loss of faith, uh, with this loss of faith, there was a replacement of the kingdom of grace. And, um, uh, and instead of this uh, kingdom of, of, of grace, the, the grace of God, with, which perfects nature, there, there came this sort of culture that uh, that would perfect nature in another way. It would be culture would be uh, that which humans do that uh, 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 in order to live better and so on and more beautifully <clears throat> and uh, and uh, 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 and uh, raise above uh, above nature. So it has been a, a, a terrible replacement, of course, because as we can see what this has inspired, it's really hardly something that we can call a culture in the sense of um, the, the perfection of our, of our virtues and, 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 and customs. And that's uh, what I wanted to mention um, uh, in the line of what you said concerning religion and culture. Thank you, Eduardo. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you pointed out, out to me because uh, in referring to Pieper's work, you know, on uh, leisure, the basis of culture, and the way it was misinterpreted, where actually what he was arguing was that religion was the basis of culture. Uh, that basically, it that appears to be uh, in, in agreement with that. And one of the reasons for this is because a religion inclines human beings to think about qualitatively higher beings. Uh, it, 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 it introduces into uh, a human... Uh, uh, human understanding, wondering, and the habit of wondering about transcendence right, and powers and abilities that individuals, have, human beings have huh, to, uh, uh, to uh, improve themselves uh, individually uh, and collectively. And um, the, um, uh, the, 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 St. Thomas's Aquinas is very clear that science, and, and anybody who teaches to, to, to Thomas knows this, St. Thomas calls a science a habit of the soul. Right? It's a psychological habit. Okay? Uh, philosophy is a species of psychology. Right? Uh, and once again, this is not new to, to Thomistic scholars. You know, they'll, they'll t you know, it was... In the 1950s, 1960s, when people taught uh, Aquinas, they would teach philosophical psychology. And even in, even in um, you know, teaching logic, they'd have a material logic, which would talk about the faculties of the soul and so forth. Huh? But the emphasis is not put on that. Okay? After that you know, is introduced, uh, students tend to think about 
philosophy being more more or less uh, a, a, a this uh, a science in the sense of demonstrative demonstrative uh, 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 proposition uh, in syllogistic logic, <laughs> now, and um, they they miss the fact that that philosophy uh, uh, that the genus of the philosopher, as Saint Thomas says, uh, I think in his comment. Book five in his commentary on metaphysics of Aristotle. There are four different side, sen senses of genera, as you know, genus. Huh? And the genus of the philosopher is not the genus of the logician, even though both of them, in a way, the logician become, be, can be called a, a philosopher. But strictly speaking, okay, um, the, uh, the philosopher is, uh, is a person who has the psychological habit of wondering about causes or principles. Huh? Uh, and to be a philosopher, to be a scientist, requires a person ha have psychological dispositions, huh? a habit of wondering about principles and causes uh, of organizational behavior. Now, this is quite simple. Huh? A, a very simple understanding of the nature of philosophy, and, and it tends to improve human life <laughs> once people get a handle on this. Huh? Uh, the that is not simply memorizing premises of logic, you know, uh, and uh, and applying them because syllogistic logic is not the logic that is involved in philosophical activity. The abstract syllogistic logic is a concrete, practical, and productive syllogistic logic that can aim simply at understanding and then be speculative, but that has to do with the doable deed. Huh? If, if, if you, people read and Etienne Gilson's great work, The Unity of Philosophical Experience, huh, this comes out quite clearly, where, where Gilson distinguishes two different senses of possible and impossible. And he's taking this from his uh, work he had written called On Painting and Reality, brilliant, his, his best metaphysical work, I think, uh, oddly enough, but dealing with painting and reality. Uh, where he says that it's conceptual possibility, which deals with abstract you know, uh, uh, possibility, uh, and doable deeds. You know? So he's constantly testing in that work whether the abstract conceptions that people have of the nature of science and philosophy, when put into practice, <laughs> actually are able to make intelligible what's going on. Huh? The... The, uh, the principles of philosophy uh, are not abstract concepts. Right? Uh, they, are, they are concrete causes. Uh, and those concrete causes include concepts. In fact, the first way we experience concepts and we define things as children, you've watched the behavior of children, uh, is by engaging in... in exhausting testing <laughs> of ideas, which they experience as moving principles. Uh, people in business uh, have this understanding of ideas. They get you doing something huh? and you come up with a, a great idea, right? uh, which stimulates your imagination, stretches your imagination to, to see whether you can take these principles and cause something to be <laughs> or not cause it to be. Right? And if we mistake these two orders of thinking, the abstract and the concrete, and we impose the abstract onto the concrete, we lose our common sense. We lose touch with reality, right? Because we come into contact with reality through this faculty of particular reason, as you well know, cogitative reason, Dr. Berno and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and his eminence emeritus, uh, Reverend uh, emeritus Bill McVeigh, huh? that uh, it's uh, it's estimative intelligence uh, or uh, this faculty of particular reason in which St. Thomas locates the habit of wondering, huh? uh, the ability to sense and possess sense memory and imagination that put us in contact with the physical universe. This doesn't happen on the level of the external senses. It doesn't happen as a result of the possession of a common sense faculty huh? or, or on the level of 
the concupiscible passions, huh? but on the level of the irascible emotions. Huh? Instinct in animal, and St. Thomas gives the examples, if you recall, about the sheep running away from the wolf. It doesn't do this because it's an, it's a, an anti-wolf bigot, racist, huh? that doesn't like the color of wolves. It realizes senses. It senses good and evil first, huh? as do human beings. And we define things uh, specific, generically and specifically in terms of doable and undoable deeds. Then when we grow to adults, after centuries, after somebody like Pat uh, Parmenides comes along and to, can, can discuss, you know, distinguish between contradictory opposite, come up with the principle of a non-contradiction, then they can have abstract logic and develop and so forth and come up that with that way of understanding ideas. But that's not the first way that they're understood. And that's not the philosophical way that they're understood. Right? Uh, and and um, uh, universities, uh, this, is, this is the foundation of the medieval university developed on the modern university, uh, uh, the, uh, the research university in places like uh, uh, Bologna and the University of Paris, the international university, which starts with the Catholic, uh, Catholic institutions, huh, is founded on this understanding of, of, of animal rationality, you know, which we've completely lost. Right? Uh, in, in modernity, uh, and, and uh, as a result of that, we, dis, dis, can, we misunderstood the nature of real psychological habits and virtues, and that higher education is, is essentially philosophical uh, education, huh? which, which requires liberal arts education first as a preparatory, being able to listen, huh? and being able to speak uh, conversationally, not just being lectured to, but starting to get involved in that great intellectual conversation right? that puts us in touch with the tradition, a tradition which saves us labor by giving us common sense principles. Huh? The principles of common sense are simply common understandings. What anybody who knows anything about anything understands that you have to understand before you start to reason. Modern philosophy thinks that, um, falsely so-called, thinks that we start reasoning without understanding. You know, well, what the hell are you reasoning about? Excuse my language, you know, but I'm getting into my, my Brooklyn mode here. What, is, what are you reasoning about? Right? <laughs> if you don't know something that really exists right? <laughs> and uh, uh, you don't understand it, uh, you'll get it. You reason about your understanding. If you understand nothing, you get nowhere uh, and you run around in a circle for centuries, which we've been doing, and now all our cultural institutions are collapsing, right? And who do you blame for it? Oh, you blame politicians. No, they're not responsible for it. The metaphysicians are responsible for it. Uh, the, the moralists uh, going back centuries. Uh, uh, and, um, and so it's crucial for us to return to an understanding of common sense. Uh, as uh, an understanding of first principles, <laughs> the person who the person who has common sense to some extent is able to zero in on first principles. Uh, the uh, Saint Thomas in t t talks about common sense actually uh, in, in in referring uh, in his, his commentary on uh, the uh, Nicomachean Ethics of Aristotle. And he talks about it as a synthesis of two principles of, uh, of um, uh, well, it's, it's a combination of the principle of syndericis and, uh, and uh, solertia, right? which combines, which combines solares and citrus, right? being shrewd right? and being, being quick-witted. Right? So that you can see the middle term of the syllogism, whether it's, it's a, an abstract syllogism, or it's a concrete syllogism, in which the middle term is a mid middle cause of action, as it refers to it. Right? Uh, and uh, if you lack that habit right, of, uh, of being able to zero in, if you don't have synesis, if you have his opposite, you're asinine. Right? You can't see 
Uh, the principle you have to start with. And then you might think, well, just because something is conceivable, let's think about, it. let's entertain the thought that simply by taking the principles of grammar, you could learn how to build a bridge. Let's empirically test that. We'll do that for centuries if you want, okay? Now, anybody that's not an idiot, okay? Uh, that it would, is, is, is not lacking in common sense uh, related to the nature of engineering would understand that you can't do that, that the engineers have some common sense, maybe related to engineering and that's it, but at least they're going to know that you can't take the principles of grammar and you don't need to empirically to test this as if your external senses could somehow verify truth that's only reprehended abstractly or concretely by the human intellect in conjunction with other faculties. Verification's an intellectual process in part, essentially. Huh? The senses in and of themselves can't do that. So the, the whole notion that science is simply a method of testing hypotheses is, is total nonsense. Huh? The, uh, it's, it's, it's a psychological habit huh? that exists in the, in, the, in the habit of the scientist. Huh? Uh, uh, if there if there were no scientists, where is, what is the method? The method is the specific habit that is being used by this or that individual that that person has mastered. Simply by applying that method uh, arbitrarily by someone, strictly speaking, doesn't make someone a scientist. Huh? It, it consists in, in, in a habit, the psychological habit. We have to get back to the whole notion that philosophy is located in the human soul that a human soul exists. It, the, 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 notion, the proper notion of philosophy was, was uh, not lost with our, our, our losing the under, our, our understanding of God. Huh? Uh, it, was, uh, it, it, was, uh, it consisted in losing our understanding of the human soul. Huh? And, and then we lost our understanding of God and we started to think that we're God. Right? Jilson says, if you want to get back, he says this in the terrors of the year 2000, if you want to get back to reality, you have to, you, you, you have to get back to an understanding of God. Right? This is true, but you can't get back to a proper understanding of God if you're not a proper understanding of the soul, because you have no common sense. Right? It doesn't do any good to preach, for example, to people like uh, theologians do today, and they talk about the common human good and so forth, huh? If you, if you have no common sense, take a look at Catholic universities today. Catholic colleges, they're, they're a mess. Yeah. Georgetown, St. John's, right? uh, Notre Dame. How are they different from Berkeley? Yeah. In many sense, Berkeley would be better. Sunni at Buffalo, I had more people that were sane huh? and in touch with reality than I, than I did in, in the Catholic universities and colleges with which I, you know, with, was educated. Right? Uh, so it's uh, this is what it, what we have to recover right? if uh, uh, if we want to uh, prevent the West uh, from imploding. Right? And now, the the reason that I focused attention in this in this book with uh, on uh, books and media on listening and speaking uh, is because that's both of these are related to the beginnings of education. Right? which requires docility, some docilitas, teachability. And when, when he's talking about natural law, St. Thomas refers to, refers to the fact that, you know, human beings are naturally inclined to educate children. Right? And, and it's part, part of being social animals. Sometimes we have children that don't tend to listen. Right? And you have to get the government involved to discipline them, which he says is every, every once in a while you need to do. But... Beginning of education starts with docilitas, teachability, and you can only teach people to to who to some extent have common sense, who can <coughs> who can understand what something is to some extent uh, and how it inclines to behave. Uh, and um, uh, we've lost our understanding of that and think we can tend to start anywhere and that education can more or less just just give people a smorgasbord of stuff and that students can <coughs> can, uh, can uh, taste of this and that uh, and that that becomes higher educate higher education 
Whereas higher education traditionally was uh, dealt with inculcating psychological habits of excellence right? related to human faculties of the soul, which are leadership principles. Right? If you get rid of the notion of the human soul, you get rid of the notion of the individual leader. You get not rid of the notion of individual freedom and you turn freedom into circumstantial at best. Okay. The, the, the not being interfered with by external circumstances. Huh? You, lose, you lose the chief understanding of human freedom, right? which is happening today all over the place, you know, especially in the United States <coughs> and Germany today, uh, among, other, among other places. Uh, but you lose the notion of individual liberty. You, can't, uh, you cannot preserve it without the faculties of the soul, uh, in which the habits uh, are, uh, are located. Right? Uh, uh, and, uh, and you cannot inculcate the principles of, of leadership in practical, productive, and speculative uh, uh, ways of knowing, uh, which uh, are the, uh, the, the, the classical divisions of, of, uh, of knowing uh, and the chief aim of the university. Get rid of the human soul, you get rid of the university. Uh, certainly the Catholic university. Uh, and you get rid of the notion that a leadership is an individual psychological habit as well as a culturally inculcated one, which when passing on the knowledge, the understanding of previous generations is passing on common sense wisdom right, to future generations. You break, you break a, an educational system uh, uh, off from its historical roots, and you 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 break it off from centuries of common sense wisdom, right? uh, and from being able to reason by enthymeme. <laughs> you don't have to go through all the stages of the, the, the syllogism once again to understand that this is where you have to start. This is how you have to reason so that you'll be able to to draw uh, uh, sound conclusions. Right. Anyway, just a I bloviated long enough in case there's any reactions to that. Thing. Peter, let me ask you a question. Yeah, sure. Um, my concern is that uh, what you're saying about the, uh, the cogitative sense, a particular reason, is uh, being uh, picked up much faster uh, by empirical psychologists uh, than it is by Thomistic philosophers and our colleagues. I mean, uh, although they may, they may not use the same uh, uh, terminology, uh, uh, but I think you and I recently in an email exchange were discussing how uh, social psychologists like Michael Billing now, although, although he uses different terminology, uh, would suggest that uh, what Freud was really trying to discover with his concept of the unconscious uh, was the, the cogitative sense that people have, that basically, you know, uh, what we suppress is our shame and terror, okay? Uh, and uh, social, psycho social sociologists now uh, are beginning to say that our whole, that this, so this whole thing called social intelligence is really based on what you've described today as uh, estimative intelligence. And uh, in social psychology, there's a tremendous interest in the, in the rediscovery of uh, the reconstruction of common sense because uh, there's a tremendous disappointment uh, in empirical uh, social psychology. So uh, I, I think in the secular disciplines uh, that um, the, um, the Enlightenment is breaking down faster uh, due to the, the postmodern critics who have no alternatives, uh, even though it may be holding in the academic community as in the secular and the real world. Uh, I think there's this resurgence of common sense. But my big problem is that uh, this is where I would agree with Michael Polony that most people's are very, very uh, inept at articulating their common sense. Most of our common sense knowledge is about 85% hidden. And the real challenge is, is, is teaching people uh, and building an educational system that allows people to mm -hmm. have confidence to articulate uh, their common sense. And that's something I don't think we're addressing here. I mean, common sense, I think, is hard to articulate. Having been in market research for a number of years, sit in a focus group and say, why do you like this product or that product? And the first thing people will say is, uh, I don't know. And it takes a very, very uh, skillful uh, researcher in qualitative research 
to bring out the the qualitative, the common sense of people. People find it very, very hard today to articulate their uh, common sense. So how would you respond to that, Peter? Yeah. Uh, I agree with you uh, related to this. In fact, the person that I think um, had the, the, the best understanding of uh, the... Uh, the nature of philosophy in the sense I'm articulating, it was Mortimer Adler. Uh, and one of the reasons that he had this uh, was because uh, <clears throat> when he started at Columbia University, uh, he was uh, what Plato described as an annoying philosophical bastard. Uh, he was uh, someone who tended to think of, of philosophy in terms of logic uh, and uh, um, logical reasoning and matters of truth uh, were matters of logic and uh, matters of taste uh, or anything that the logician didn't deal with uh, until Adler got slapped down by the faculty at Columbia University and had to come in touch with reality uh, after he abused John Dewey mercilessly. Uh, and Dewey, while he was, uh, I think, metaphysically way you know off the off the charts, didn't know what he was talking about philosophically. He was a nice guy. <laughs> he was a decent human being, and he understood philosophy as a tradition. <laughs> Uh, and in, in, in which you, you know you had to you had to respect it, that it was an enterprise, right? uh, and, and uh, that uh, this this eventually so Adler as a result of this he he started to he, he thought to himself unless you can unless you can achieve an understanding of philosophy as a social science enterprise you're not going to be able to sell it to the general public okay they're not going to recognize its true worth right. And it took him decades to understand that what he was getting at, Aristotle had already done. This is what this is the way the ancients had had understood philosophy, that it's a social science enterprise in, in the sense that it's a psychological enterprise as as a collective, cultural, transgenerational uh, enterprise. If you don't have the proper culture, right? uh, if you don't have a culture that has that has inclined human beings through their poetry, through the liberal arts to wonder huh, about great things, uh, about great deeds, about the gods, uh, for example, huh? uh, and, and, and metaphysically and morally, the, the, the place that human beings occupy in the universe, that genus, the wider genus of the, the real genus of the universe and how it operates, huh? Uh, you cannot start to get on the right page. Uh, whenever human beings, uh, in, in discussions, whenever human beings get in discussions about anything, we do so within the context of a real genus. We're constantly switching back and forth between real gen genera and real species. The example I like to give is that of, of, of people who are bowlers who uh, are, uh, are actually firefighters, and they go to the bowling alley one uh, one one weekend, and a fire breaks out in the bowling alley. They don't throw bowling balls at the fire. They immediately break into their psychological habit of being firefighters, you know, and they don't think to themselves, "Oh, my wife, I mean, she's out at home. You know, she's going to complain if I'm over here fighting a fire because I'm going to get home late." You know, they're constantly we're constantly switching back and forth trying to understand what's the organizational whole which we are involved now in this situation, right? And what are the principles that I have to, I, I have to understand? Those principles being people, <laughs> powers, abilities, uh, times and places. This is the way St. Thomas, for example, talks about principles when he's, he's talking to some of the uh, uh, related to internal and, and external principles of moral activity, right? The principles of activity are the principles of a real genus. Right? Who's doing what, to what, with what, where, why, when, and how? Now you know your genus. <laughs> if you understand that, right? uh, and and that has to be that has to be habituated culturally in, in in individuals. So you have educational institutions right? that that uh, are, are able to transmit the wealth of wisdom and prudence from prior generations to, to, to subsequent generations. That's what the social sciences do. Okay? The social scientists tell us, should tell us about human behavior. 
right? uh, and all its different aspects, right? and are the principles and causes, and and the psychological habit of wondering about principles and causes is what science is all about. Right? As Dr. Bernal has uh, that, uh, made evident to us in that masterful thesis, uh, dissertation he wrote on the uh, mathematical, the nature of mathematics in light of the principles of St. Thomas Aquinas, which you know, when you get, get you get down to all its parts, comes to around 1,400 pages, from what I recall. I mean, after I dealt with that man in in you know in, in directing that thesis, I said, I gotta get I gotta get out of here. I've got to, you know, I don't belong in chairing this uh, this uh, department uh, or this division at Holy Apostles. This guy is so far transcends me in ability. I'm going to go somewhere else. <laughs> you know, he's got to take over and uh, and move it. So anybody who's looking for the person who's the leading Thomistic scholar in the world today with whom they should study. It's Eduardo Bernal. But I know my his eminence is going to say, well, literally, this is only because he taught Eduardo everything he knows. Everything he knows. <laughs> and, and I would agree 100%. <laughs> yes, well, that's because he took you through that torturous preparation you know, on uh, developing street smarts and how to handle uh, Spanish education. You know, to, uh, so, to be able to manipulate it in such a way as finally to get that... Um, that dissertation done. <laughs> well, Peter, here's my acid question on common sense. I mean, people have common sense are willing to live with mm-hmm. an awful lot of probability, not certainty. Mm-hmm. And philosophers like certitude. Yeah. So you've just wiped out the whole discipline of philosophy. Right. You know, uh, Bill, common sense is, uh, is, is predicated analogously. That's the problem understanding is most of us, most of the time, have no common sense. Uh, the uh, yeah, uh, Sebastian uh, said, makes a remark. So the genus, I think he says, can change with the circumstances. Yes, mm-hmm. uh, it's always it's always change. We're always switching. I'm constantly asking myself where I am, uh, and and I don't know. Want to know my physical location? I want to know my psychological location. What am I thinking about? <laughs> so that I don't commit, I don't get messed up in my organizations and applying the principles of one organization to another which is deadly. This is what people mean when they say you're not on the right page. The first thing that you have to, in in order to engage in a profitable conversation, you have to be defining what you're talking about. Uh, You have to to be able to to, to listen to the definitions. This is what philosophical reading is all about. You've got to pick up definitions that people are using and how they're using them in relationship to this or that. And the definitions uh, philosophically, are ones that are able to cause deeds to be done, uh, to be uh, to be realized. So, uh, common sense simply means uh, what's commonly understood by the people who understand what they're doing. Right? That's the way we tend to mean it. So, you're lacking in common sense to the extent that 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 everybody who knows anything about their subject, you know, is, you know, like fighting fires is. Don't mix these chemicals together like that to try to put out a fire with them because you're going to create an explosion, right? And you abstractly say to yourself, well, how do you know that? And where where did you get this understanding from, right? Uh, Let's take the idea of this and the idea of that. You know what? It comes from practical experience of living, right? You know, and knowing that these two two things can't be put together into an organizational whole that will operate, right? Because real organizations exist in and through the harmony of, it, of their parts. Huh? To create an organizational unity and the specification comes from the actions. Huh? The genus is the organizational whole, unity, or one. Huh? And it's specified, well, okay, a heart surgeon, you know, a heart surgeon on the one hand, a biologist, they both studied the human heart. They said studied the gen- same genus differently. Okay? So it's specifically different, actually. Uh-huh. While they're studying the same genus, in a way, in a way they're not, uh, because this one's studying it from the standpoint of, ge- of, of, of generating life. The other's from generating ger- generating health, or or a person who's a physical therapist, you know, from doing exercise to to benefit uh, the the heart. And when you understand this notion of a genus. 
you don't get mixed up with the, thinking that someone like Darwin knew what he was talking about. Huh? Uh, where they totally messed up. They taught that, that Darwin understood genus and, and, and species. He didn't make a distinction between genus and species, and he identified species with race. Historical, you know, so an historical race from which you are descended, uh, like uh, like the, this person begat that person who begat that person who begat that person in scripture, you know? uh, and uh, you know, and so what, when 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 uh, you talk about defining things in terms of genus and species today, students think you're a racist <laughs> because they can't think outside; they have no understanding of the of the nature of these principles. You know, as uh, as educational causes, right? Of definite, of real definition. Huh? Uh, the um, uh, so um, uh, there's no way that we can use the contemporary educational institutions to correct these problems. Huh? Why? Because as Dr. Hancock says, the the incendiaries. Uh, you can't ask the incendiaries to help you put out the fires far. <laughs> you can't. You can't have. People who 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 are, are solely trained within co contemporary educational institutions uh, to be able to solve these problems, you have to you have to create something entirely new, uh, which is one of the reasons why I've been working on this common sense wisdom education, uh, common sense wisdom uh, executive coaching uh, academy. Uh, the best the best hope, as you were noting. Uh, um, uh, Bill, uh, um, for understanding what I'm talking about comes from people in business and military. You know, they follow <laughs> what, I, what I'm talking about. Academics have more of a difficult time figuring out what, what, is, what is he talking about. You know, this makes no makes no sense. Well, abstractly, yeah, it's not going to make uh, make sense to a, to a lot of people. But once you understand, well, I'm talking about common sense analogously, simply. You know, understand most of I have I lack common sense in pretty much everything in my life. <laughs> I've got this one narrow area where I've got some common sense. Uh, and I can I can communicate with other people about it and it helps them improve their lives uh, uh, to, to a large extent from what I've what I found. Uh, but um, uh, don't ask me to to uh, to uh, to comment about common sense and you know pretty much anything else else you know because I'll get you lost. <laughs> well, have yeah. to go there, Peter. We'll have to do this. Um, we we'll do this more frequently. You know, just uh, the group of us. Uh -huh. yes. Yes. Fascinating, uh, fascinating material. Okay, thank you. Um, but I mean, it's it's something we can live by too. You know, it's a uh, it's a philosophy, a living philosophy. Well, that's what it has to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's philosophy. What good, 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 what good is it? What's the good of it? You know, if, you, uh, if you can't improve your life, right, in becoming more perfect in what you're doing. Uh, all human beings have this naturally desire as organizational beings to be perfect. Sure. Yes. Remember, Peter, I've spoken to your wife about your common sense, too. Right, this is true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, um, we're, we're at the end of our hour. Um, uh, Peter, do you have any final thoughts uh, before um, Dr. Bernot leaves us uh, leads us in prayer? Uh, no, I don't think so. As, aside from simply the fact that uh, I also am working on that uh, Common Sense Wisdom Executive Coaching Academy, and I have my website, the Aquinas School of Leadership, that uh, talks about uh, the need to... Uh, uh, to, to, to develop uh, these courses reflecting on common sense, uh, the nature of common sense, which I'm going to do uh, also with Holy Apostles, I think, uh, develop a couple of few of those. Oh, wow. That's a, that's a real gift. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, well, well, all right. Uh, well, let's, um, uh, Eduardo, uh, Dr. Beno, if you would uh, lead us in a closing prayer, um, we'll bring sure. today's hour. I've chosen a, a prayer that I, I think uh, is eminence emeritus uh, Professor McVeigh will appreciate because uh, it comes from um, a, well, it's actually an anonymous author, 
uh, but he's a, a Jesuit, uh, so he's uh, close in the uh, congregation of our uh, beloved uh, Pope, and I think he will appreciate that. And it's precisely for the Easter season. It's very short, and it goes like this, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May the joy and promise of this joyous time of year bring peace and happiness to you and those you hold most dear. And may Christ, our risen Savior, always be there by your side to bless you most abundantly and be your loving guide. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank, thank you so very much, good doctors. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.